Hi everybody again. I am going to finish up the questions today. Obviously I didn't answer all of them. Uh, I'm not going to because a lot of them just, um, I've already covered in other videos and I might cover in the future. But for now, this is going to be the end of the, the Q&A that I had put on, on Twitter. I'm going to answer two more questions that was in that list. And then uh, that's, that's going to be all. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your participation, by the way. Um, I like I like having conversations with people. I like talking to people. Um, and I like educating. But like, you know, in, in a good sense, not the um, queer sense. <laughs> so let's just jump right in. Do you think... It's common for same-sex attracted people to have gender dysphoria or something akin to it. And if so, why? So, yes, I, I do think it's pretty common. And this is something I've thought about a lot over the years. Um, just from my own perspective, it seemed very normal to happen. Um, I've... You know, I do a lot of work with um, LGB Alliance US and most of the, the same-sex attracted people that I've talked to in that organization have expressed some, some sort of gender dysphoria as kids and even into adulthood. And the thing about gender dysphoria though is it's not very well defined. And so that's, I mean, that's problem number one. It's, it's, and it's very umbrella. Uh, it's a very umbrella term too. It tends to encompass a lot of stuff or uh, the common, the common way that um, therapists uh, tend in the mental health community tend to handle this gender dysphoria label is really to throw almost everything underneath it. So that's a problem. Um, but if we're going to take the, 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 the meaning of gender dysphoria to be being uncomfortable in some way with your biological sex, then yes, a lot of same-sex attracted people, I think, have struggled with that or do struggle with that. And I think in childhood it, it is especially common because... Um, we're learning where we belong, you know, we're to get real big picture here, you know, we're just humans are just animals, you know, um, most of the stuff we do is off instinct, whether we realize it or not. We're very social animals. We want to belong. Um, it's, it's, it's just hardwired in there to belong to a group and feel safe. And so, I think a normal part of childhood development is to look around at the adults, your peers, and just the world around you and try to find where you belong. And if you are a child who is gender non-conforming, um, for example, let's take the most, seems to be the most hated gender non-conformity in children, the effeminate little boy. Um, I mean, we, we've all seen, we've all seen little boys who like, even at four years old, three years old, seem to, to act differently than the other boys, seem to act effeminate, seem to act more like girls. And I honest, honestly don't know where that comes from. I don't know if it's innate or not. I, um, we don't know, but we see that it happens. And so, so, so this little boy um, is going to look around. He's, he's going to want to belong somewhere. And if he's getting ostracized by his peers, the other boys, which often happens. I mean, kids especially, if something's off about another kid, like they are, they're very much in their little animal mode. You know, they will, they'll kick you out of the group. Um, maybe he's not being accepted by the other boys, his peers. And very often even the parents and adults around him are telling him 
that the what he's doing and the way he's acting and basically who he is is wrong there's something wrong with him and that is enough right there that's gender dysphoria you you so so what is he gonna do now he's like i i hate being a boy i hate a boys are supposed to act this way Suppose boys are supposed to do this way. I obviously am not meeting those criteria. I obviously can't do this. I freaking hate myself. You know, I felt that way too. I mean, I think this is a very common experience with, you know, uh, gender nonconforming kids, um, particularly ones that grow up to be gay, um, maybe bisexual, but usually homosexual. We we just. We don't have a place. Don't have a place to land. We don't have a place to go, and we're being told we're wrong. And I think that develops into hating yourself, hating your sex. And then, as you get older, and you start to kind of recognize that you are, you know, getting crushes on the same sex. You know, getting crushes on you know, the little boy is maybe starting to get crushes on other little boys in his in his. Uh, class or a neighborhood or whatever but not the little girls and as he gets older he's getting now he's starting to get you know puberty hits and now he's starting to actually get you know those those the the sex drive and the real sexual attraction that um adults have and it's towards the same and i think there is I've, recently a gay man was talking about that he feels like a lot of times there is envy um, involved starting in childhood from homosexuals. Uh, so like a little boy who is effeminate and being told, you know, he's acts like a girl and he's wrong and everything. He is going, he might develop just a desire and an envy to be female of women because he feels like if he was that, then he could freely enjoy and be loved and cared for by who he's attracted to, you know, other men. And what he sees around him is just women are allowed to be attracted and, and have sex with men. Men are only allowed to be attracted to and marry and have sex with women. And little, um, uh, girls that will grow up to be lesbians um we want that and boys that will grow up to be gay they they want they want that too and i you know i i kind of agree with some of his take i there might be there might be some envy that starts in i mean and it's not i don't think it's malicious like it's not envy in a bad way it's just it develops i mean you can't help it you live in a world that just doesn't let you exist naturally and also, it can be very lonely being same-sex attracted. We are a very small minority. And um, it's really hard to find other humans that are, you know, only same-sex attracted that we can feel comfortable with. So, all that taken into consideration, I think the trajectory of, of people that will grow up to be homosexual or same-sex attracted uh, in childhood, I think the gender dysphoria is really... I think it could be quite common. I think it is quite common. I think it might be kind of a normal, a normal childhood development process for homosexuals or, or same-sex attracted uh, adults, humans, that this hasn't been studied much, hasn't been looked at, and I mean, maybe no one just cares about it. Um, maybe we focus a little too much on, I don't know. Nature versus nurture. We don't tend to take both of them into consideration. We sometimes put too much in nature and too much or too much in nurture. And I don't believe it's, I, I believe that nothing is strictly uh, nurture and nothing is strictly nature. They are intertwined together and we can't pull them apart. And I don't think we know which bits do which to any great certainty. But I, uh, well, I think that covered the why, too. I did, you know, I wrote an article for LGB Alliance US, and it's on the website, and I'll link it um, with this video. I wrote about the perspective of um, butch lesbians, I guess, uh, gender dysphoria being common in butch lesbians. And 
So that kind of speaks to some of this too. And you can kind of apply the same thing to um, anybody who would be in that kind of position of being ostracized or ridiculed or anything for their sexuality or their presentation. So thanks for that question though. It's, I think it's, I think it's one of those key questions we need to start asking and need to start demanding that the mental health community takes into consideration because right now I believe the mental health community is um, basically doing what they have done since the beginning to homosexuals. Um, they are medicalizing us and trying to make us straight. Next question. What would you say to the detransitioners who are just realizing what was done to them, are being ignored by their old friends and community, and feel alone now? This is tough. This is a tough one. I don't ever feel like that good at answering these questions, but I'll try. I usually say this to most that maybe I, I am having a chat with or I run across on Twitter who are newly... Um, kind of newly coming out of the fog of transition and realizing that, you know, it was a sham um, and they were harmed. They feel very harmed and they were, you know, we all were. I tell them that they, they may feel alone, but they're not alone. They are not alone. There are, I mean, I don't have numbers. I can't throw out a number, but many, many of us who exists right now, um, who are on social media talking, who are on YouTube talking, who are, who are out there. Um, and I think for every one of us that is out here speaking, there might be a hundred that aren't speaking. So there is a lot of us, there's a lot of detransitioners out there, a lot of people who feel the same way they're feeling right now. So you're not alone. You're not alone. All you have to do really is, is start to look and you'll find us and we're there. And I know when I first started this journey, I, f I was not super into the like trans community or anything. Um, but because any, I, because I couldn't go to a therapist and like talk about this stuff because I couldn't go to a doctor because like I couldn't even go to f most family and even friends cause they just, they didn't get it. Um, I did feel super alone and I felt like, oh my God, I felt like the only one who's doing this. <laughs> um, and I remember telling my wife, I don't even know where to start. I don't know where to start with this. And, and she had been on Reddit and this was a couple years ago when Reddit wasn't so like absurdly like locked down like it is now, um, censoring everybody. She had been on there on, I think, like one of the GC subreddits. And she was like, start with Reddit. Who knows? Throw it out there. There might be something there. And I started on Reddit. And that's where I found uh, the D-Trans Reddit. It was very small then. And I basically just was like, hey, I'm here. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, and, and from there blossomed lot of connections um some that ended up in the real world connections or I got to hang out with actual other detransition women in real life and um go to uh I got to go to like this little camp out thing that was just for detransition detransition women like six months into my detransition it was super helpful a lot of I mean most of the support was on social media and and online but I thought it was still very helpful um, but some of the in-person stuff was really good too. So you, you just have to start, you know, and you don't have to put yourself out there like super big. You don't have to show your face. You don't have to use your real name, but you can still find support. And we're here. And I have really never met a detransitioner who hasn't been pretty open and wanting to help and share our experiences. I mean, I think we're, I mean, we're not a monolith, obviously, but in general, we're people who have been put through a meat grinder um, and we've come out the other side and we don't want more people to go in that meat grinder. And so we're here to help the ones, that, those of us who are active speaking about it. Um, and it, it's hard to lose, like I said, I wasn't involved in the trans community really deeply, so I didn't really lose the whole trans community part of friends and community. However, um, 
as a lesbian, when I came out in my early 20s, I lost everything. I lost family, I lost friends, and I lost a whole community that I was deeply involved in and that I think really, I don't know, I used to um, I used to ride horses and do some rodeos and stuff like that and I was very involved in in horses and the equestrian stuff and um, that was my whole community and when I came out my close friends pretty much ostracized me um, and then if I had to if anybody knew I was gay they wouldn't want me around their kids they didn't really want me in their groups I mean it just I got iced out basically I mean yeah I guess I could have stuck it out but like who does that who wants to do that and so I left I left you know I kind of got kicked out and I left the community so you know you're so many people have been through ostr you know being ostracized from their communities for basically being themselves being honest and being truthful and it sucks and it's hard but there are other communities out there. There are other people out there that you can like belong to and, and join and feel community with. And that's, you know, it's a, it's a tough process and um, it can take a while to find your group, but you can find your group. I did. Um, so, you know, stick with it. It's going to be okay. You're going to get through this. Many, many of us have been through it before. I think that's all I can add to that one. Thank you guys for um, sending me questions. Thank you for watching my videos. I appreciate it. Um, I'll try to do more of these when I can. I I tend to I tend to throw a lot of things on my plate and then <laughs> and then go, oh my gosh, I'm not keeping up with the things. It's typical. Uh, I think it's very typical ADHD stuff. Which reminds me, I think I'm going to do another vi the, the next video I do. Um, it might, it might take a week or so for me to get to get here, but next video I do, I think I'm going to talk about ADHD. Um, I'm going to want to have some information pulled that I can kind of reference. So it's going to be a little bit more prepared video. I'm going to talk about my experience with it. I'm going to talk about it in general and then a little bit, I guess, about, you know, how that plays into, um, the, the trans thing, because what I've noticed, and I think there's some statistics to show this as well, is it is a very high percentage of neurodivergent people who have transitioned or are transidentified and neurodivergent being the main two, ADHD and autism. Um, so, and I, I know that pretty much most of my D-trans female friends have ADHD. So, I mean, it's, it's an interesting topic. Um, so yeah, look forward to that one. Okay, bye.